This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. In the future, there will be no resistance to the widespread adoption of superconductors. So today is our 250th weekly episode and we'll be looking at superconductors, how they work, what they can do for us, and what the impact of them will be on our civilization. This is a tricky topic because on the one hand we already have superconductors and their impact has been rather large already, but what we usually mean are room temperature superconductors, those would open up doors for us to do some truly impressive mega engineering among other technological feats, particularly if twinned together with the invention of a material that acted as a true magnetic shield, which we'll discuss later. Let's talk about the most obvious impact first though. Right now, we are always short of electricity, especially from cheap and renewable sources. However, something like half our electric production simply goes to waste as heat in the electric lines from your local power plant to the power outlet in your wall. The longer the line, the more is wasted, and so often even better and more efficient power options can't be used because the distance involved makes it less efficient. Solar panels located in the desert with ample sunlight, but far from human habitation, lose too much power to transmission distances. Solar is also off half the day at nighttime and weak when it's cloudy, but the Earth generally has a steady supply somewhere. If distance wasn't an issue, we could easily supply everyone all day from solar because it's a bright sunny day somewhere. Why is this? Well, most folks are familiar with the idea of electric conductivity and resistance, that any given electric wire, or any other substance, has a certain resistance that any electricity passing through it must overcome, and it acts like friction on a car, the road friction and air drag just slow you down and leach energy that must be replaced, wires do this and power leaks out, wasted as heat. Now metals in general tend to have lower resistance than many other materials, which is to say that they conduct electricity better and often have a much lower resistance as temperature drops. We'd hypothesized it might drop to zero at low enough temperatures, possibly only at absolute zero, but in 1911 Hayakianis found that mercury at 4 Kelvin had absolutely zero resistance. Scientists found some more materials that could also do this, superconduct, but the problem was all of them had to be ultra cold. Temperature is not found anywhere on this planet outside a laboratory, or indeed anywhere in this solar system, so its industrial application was pretty limited, particularly since those temperatures could only be achieved with liquid helium, which is vastly more expensive to make than liquid nitrogen, largely in part to helium scarcity here on Earth. While wrapping all electric lines in sheets of liquid helium would have dealt with waste electricity, it would also have required a huge output of power and money to supply all that refrigerant as it warmed. We also had no idea how superconducting was happening, and we had thought it would need to be near absolute zero. We'll get to why in a moment, but first we should note that since a superconducting wire can have an electric current flow through it without diminishing, and since running current through a coil produces a magnetic field, a superconductor can't produce a constant magnetic field for free, except the cost of cooling it and the initial current input. This is why superconductors are often shown levitating things such as magnets, So long as you keep them cold enough to superconduct, they will keep levitating. This is still not free energy, as magnetic fields do not do work in the physical sense. A charged object in one can change direction, but it retains the same total kinetic energy. It can circle around for instance, same as a planet orbiting in a gravitational field. So superconductors are not what people call perpetual motion machines, in that they don't generate free energy or violate the laws of thermodynamics though they could allow an object in a vacuum chamber to remain perpetually in motion. That's the issue with superconductivity in the first place. In an ideal metal or crystal, all the atoms are nicely lined up and so a wave, like that of an electron carrying charge and electric current, could go through unimpeded, with no resistance. In practice that perfect lattice of atoms isn't going to be perfect. Some atoms will be out of place or the wrong kind, the metal not being perfect pure, There are many other factors that can impact resistance and conductivity, some of which are not temperature based. However, to worsen it, our concept of heat, at the microscopic scale and even smaller, is really random atoms and such bouncing around, and if they are bouncing around randomly they obviously are not perfectly aligned. The hotter something is, the more random bouncing is involved, so the more resistance we had in that lattice. 
as we cooled it down, that went down, but even in a perfect metal or crystal lattice, it couldn't be zero bouncing around, allowing zero resistance or superconductivity, unless there was no random motion, which is to say no heat, or absolute zero. Which even today we still figure is impossible to actually reach, even if we can come close to it, with laboratories able to take things to less than a billionth of a Kelvin above absolute zero. Of course back in 1911 when James Dewar and Anas were pushing the limits of cold, they weren't down under a Kelvin yet and as mentioned had already found some material superconducted above that. And this is where the notion of a Cooper pair comes in. Classic cold superconductors are thought to work because electrons can pair up tightly and at a lower energy level, when normally two electrons would instead repel each other. This allows easier transit through a material, so all those random motions don't matter as much. This pairing can only happen at lower temperatures, and still needs that lower level of random bouncing and heat, but allows them to genuinely superconduct at exceptionally low temperatures but not at absolute zero. Now, two quick notes there. First, a lot of emphasis should be on how superconductors are thought to work, because we are still not entirely sure how they do work, especially the warmer ones. And second, what temperature means for superconductors. Classic cold ones are those that operate under 30 Kelvin, or temperatures you would have problems finding naturally even out at Pluto. When we say warm temperature superconductor, we are not talking about what you or I would find warm, or even what Antarctica would. We were talking about warmer than Pluto, and generally don't even call it high temperature superconductivity rather than warm temperature till it reaches liquid nitrogen temperatures, which are still colder than any place on Earth. We've been getting warmer as we've improved research, the current record was set about 33 years after we first encountered a warm temperature superconductor in 1986, that was a copper oxide that superconducted at 35 Kelvin, and this resulted in a big boom of research on the field. When I was in college for physics in the late 1990s and early 2000s, our department had a few folks specializing in this area, and we had some superconductors on hand that could operate at liquid nitrogen temperatures, handy as liquid nitrogen is vastly cheaper than liquid helium to make and use. To this day though, we still have only theory for how they function, as it's quite different than the classic cord superconductors. Still, even liquid nitrogen is hardly free, nor do great big cooling apparatuses make for cheap electric grids or superconducting microcircuits for commercial application. And by the way, finding superconductors that you can cool with liquid nitrogen instead of liquid helium is pretty important for applications, especially larger scale ones. As a rule of thumb, wherever you live in the developed world, in whichever decade of the 20th or 21st century, liquid helium costs about as much per liter as good scotch while liquid nitrogen costs about as much as milk. And then there's the fact that Earth's atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, so if you compress and refrigerate it yourself, you can pretty much have all you want and don't have to chuck it in, because it's all around you. Our high temperature superconducting record was broken again in 2019 as scientists found one that operated at the scorching hot temperature of 250 Kelvin, which is negative 23 Celsius or negative 9.4 Fahrenheit, so still cold but that is a temperature that actually occurs on Earth. Moreover, many of the other warm temperature superconductors, while being quite cooled by our standards, would operate on other worlds like Pluto, and naturally occurring ones potentially forming something akin to a computer is one of the more interesting scenarios we contemplated in our look at non-carbon based life earlier this year. While our best is still arctic temperatures, there does seem ever more reason to believe we will find one that can operate at room temperature. That is the biggest game changer if we can get it. However, a few caveats there. First, we probably would want a bit better than room temperature, though it isn't entirely necessary, but you would not want anything in regular use that stopped doing its job the instant it got a bit warm. Second, they also stop doing their job if they get impinged on by magnetic fields, either powerful enough ones or sometimes any at all, depending on the material. We really don't have good magnetic shielding, normally we shield from magnetic fields by sheer distance, or by using materials with high magnetic permeability. The best magnetic shielding generally being provided by what we call Mu metal, Mu being the symbol for magnetic permeability in equations, and this is a ferromagnetic alloy of nickel and iron, though it's something of a blanket term for such materials and we've discovered many more that do the job better in one or more respects. 
They may be good enough to shield thin wires of superconductors so that we could use them in small and cheap applications, but it would depend on how sensitive to magnetic fields a room temperature superconductor was. We don't even know if one exists, let alone how sensitive it or any others we might find would be. So these are less than perfect as shields but might be enough, and would be for certain applications at least. However, as we discussed in our episode Advanced Metamaterials, we do have reason to think we might be able to make metamaterials that shield far better, or perhaps even perfectly. We don't know if we can make these or how big, bulky, expensive, or durable they might be. And last of course, for the hypothetical room temperature superconductor, its properties in terms of cost and durability would matter too. If the stuff is brittle and breaks easily, and many are ceramics, or requires something scarce like platinum or some rare isotope or transuranic element, it might be less than useful for commercial or big scale application. If it is sturdy and cheap, but made of toxic materials, you don't want it in household items. Amusingly, mercury and lead were all for superconductors. Alright, let's assume we had such a material though, one that worked at room temperature and even a bit higher and which was decently durable and could handle magnetic fields well, either from being robust to them or by having a good shielding material for them, and which didn't cost a fortune to manufacture or cause huge health or environmental risks. The first big impact would be on the electric grid, because you'd have almost twice as much electricity for the same fuel and operation costs, just from the lack of heat losses from resistance. And you could put your power generators far away so building your nuclear fission plants in some very remote place, far from people or seismic activity, and in large fission clusters would be possible, as would transcontinental power lines so surplus power, say some more daytime solar in Australia, or the Sahara, could pump to Alaska or Siberia in the dead of night. No need for batteries. However, superconductors permit some exceptionally good batteries, Superconducting Magnetic Energy Storage, or SMES, is where you put electricity directly into a superconductor. This is already in use in many applications despite the cooling cost, as it has virtually no delay in charge or discharge. That makes it great for adding to power grids that have sudden drops in transmission or spikes in demand, as it can cycle up near instantly to stabilize the supply. A room temperature version might allow a very compact battery that could be rapidly charged, which is obviously ideal for everything from phones and laptops to electric vehicles. The rapid discharge also opens the doors to things like laser rifles or manned portable railguns, especially as for the latter the superconductors would be rather handy for the magnetic coils in that railgun. They'd also be handy for large scale railguns like the mass driver for launching things into orbit. Lastly, as it is a superconductor, you are not losing energy appreciably while it's stored, hypothetically no longer how long you're storing it. So one benefit we mentioned, being able to move power from surplus to places that need it, based on time of day, season, or weather, is amusingly a bit less valuable as this same technology allows better battery storage too. Though of course even if we don't have to cool it, we still need to maintain a given battery and build it in the first place too, so there is still an energy storage cost, just far less. That is not the only power storage method magnetics allows either. We've worked on creating magnetically suspended flywheels in vacuums, essentially a disc which you spin using energy and stores that energy, like a flywheel energy storage or FES system, but which isn't losing energy to air drag or friction on its axis. We can already do this, but it is a bit bulky and not something you put in a typical personal vehicle. That is potentially very handy for spacecraft using electric engines, especially if in coordination with beamed power transmission, since if it lost the beam for a bit, it could keep operating until the connection was re-established. Room temperature application is ideal but since we're discussing spacecraft it is again worth remembering that many places are much colder than Earth and the vacuum of space, while usually about the same temperature as any planet or object nearby it would be, can be made very cold simply by using shades and mirrors to keep sunlight off it. One problem with putting major bases on the moon is the concern about what to use for power. As while it is great for solar during the daytime, getting as much light as Earth, and indeed more since it has no atmosphere blocking light let alone clouds, those daytimes last a couple weeks, but so do the night times. SMES or Advanced FES Energy Storage gets around this issue, assume you can mass produce them, and we've got some very cool places on the moon down in deep craters where we might house such batteries made of more modest temperature superconductors. 
cold places in vacuum are not in shortage in the solar system, nor are places far from any major interfering magnetic fields, so superconductors may see major use in space colonization even without room temperature ones. Possibly nearer at home too. We've discussed many active support structures like the Lofstrom Loop or Orbital Ring, and while both can work without superconductors, they become much less major power gluttons with them. Since they are in pretty active use as transport systems, you benefit a lot from having advanced magnetic shielding in play, but if you had that, then this becomes a truly huge boon to space colonization from the shield launch cost savings involved, which are far higher if you're not having to burn a lot of energy or coolant on keeping your magnetic launch or support system running. See our episodes on that topic for more information on why these are awesome for mass transit to space. How about back down on Earth? Well, for mass transit, big levitating trains sure are nice, but if you got really good batteries and really low loss power transmission you can't just keep using personal vehicles, possibly levitating ones too, potentially even levitating buildings or cities, though you definitely want to have good magnetic shielding before you try that. You can also use it as an effective frictionless surface for the space between a rotating habitat and its non-rotating superstructure, which is particularly handy if you're trying to employ the trick for getting around tensile strength limits we discussed in our episode Continent-Sized Rotating Space Habitats. However, the really cool part about superconductors, to me at least, is the options it opens up for mega engineering projects. We often talk about building structures using active support, such as that orbital ring or what we call an atlas pillar essentially a long straightened loop of material flowing up then around and down again over and over inside magnets. We looked at this in more detail in Space Towers, and there is no energy loss at all if it is essentially a closed and charged up loop inside magnetic shielding to form a structural member Then you've got something with an arbitrarily high compressive strength to be building out of. This could allow buildings thousands of kilometers tall instead of thousands of meters, Combined with its more circular or elliptical sibling, the orbital ring, we could potentially manufacture cheap, durable megastructures far too large to make from classical materials or even many of the supermaterials like graphene. Indeed you could fabricate entire artificial planets this way, or even giant ones, like we looked at in Mega Earths or Matryoshka Worlds. So when it comes to the impact of superconductors on our world, It's a pretty big one, including potentially letting us build new worlds. We've got a couple of announcements before you get to the schedule, including celebrating our 250th episode. First off, for those of you who have subscribed to our new streaming service Nebula, you already know that we put all of our weekly episodes up there too, not just our early releases and Nebula exclusive episodes like the Coexistence with Alien series. However, I decided to start putting ad and sponsor free versions of the new regular weekly episodes up there, and since those are usually ready a bit earlier I will start releasing the weekly episodes on Nebula ad free a day or two before our normal Thursday morning airing. Nebula is an experiment I and a bunch of other channels started up last year as an alternative to YouTube dependence and this is a pair of features that we all thought our audiences would appreciate. So again, the new episodes of our show will be available there now a day or two early and without ads in them. We'll continue to experiment and to add features as time goes on, both there and on YouTube and our other platforms too. Now Nebula is its own separate streaming service, but our friends at CuriosityStream do offer it as a free add-on if you subscribe to them, and since they have so much excellent educational content of their own and are running a 26% discount if you use the link in the description, it's a great deal. It means you get a year of both CuriosityStream and Nebula for less than $15, and helps support this show and a lot of other educational content which is what CuriosityStream and Nebula are all about, and again you can get a year of both for less than $15 by using the link in the episode's description. So today marks our 250th weekly episode which is a bit of a misnomer since there's well over 300 videos on the channel between bonus episodes and live streams and these days the episode numbering is essentially what production week we are in. Amusingly, that should also be over 300 as it's been 306 weeks since the original episode on Megastructures, just under 6 years ago, but we didn't do regular weekly episodes till early 2016 and amusingly for fans of our Thursdays, I was actually releasing them on Fridays for a while. And these days we do more like 76 episodes a year, our regular 52 weekly episodes plus a monthly bonus episode plus a monthly livestream. No matter how you count it, it's a lot of episodes and it seems like forever since we began. 
I'm not sure if anyone who subscribed to the show back when it only had one episode on it in 2014 is still around watching these days, or how many of you have actually watched every single episode since that would take nearly a week without pausing for a drink and a snack, let alone sleep, but if you have, thank you. I hope it has been as fun and interesting a journey for you as it has been for me and I hope you enjoy the next 250 episodes just as much. Speaking of upcoming episodes, today we were talking about how superconductors might make it easier to build titanic megastructures, and next week we'll take a look not at various types of megastructures but rather how you might go about navigating around them and to them. Then on Sunday, August 16th, we'll be teaming up with the Exoplanets channel and Parallax Nick for a three-part bonus episode, talking of aliens and laser SETI. The week after that we will return to the Fermi Paradox series to contemplate galactic disasters. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to help support future episodes, you can donate to us on Patreon or on our website, IsaacArthur.net, which are linked in the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.